I'd like to try to give you some variety in at least the delivery of some of the lessons. And tonight, what we're going to do is, I um, hope I'm not out of my depth too much, but be a little bit philosophical tonight. The Bible says that it's wrong to lie. But is there ever a situation in which it could be right? The Bible says it's wrong to steal. But what if you're family is starving. Does that change the way we think about stealing? Abortion is an issue that we'll use as an example. If abortion is absolutely morally wrong, then it should never be allowed, no matter the circumstances of the pregnancy. And some people will say, well, if you have this inflexible position on abortion, it, it, or on any of these things. It pays no attention to the complexity of the situation, to the uniqueness of the people involved, and if you live your life this way with this wooden interpretation of Scripture and this black and white, it can result in this callous and inhumane way of dealing with very delicate problems. And some people will say, well, depending on the situation, abortion is the most humane thing to do, and it's, it's a loving thing to do, even, perhaps even saying it's the right thing to do. We've just given a couple of examples of situation ethics. This is moral decision-making that is contextual, that it's dependent on a set of circumstances. It's moral judgments... And it's the belief that these judgments have to be made within the context of the whole situation. And all normative features, all unchanging features, uh, they, they depend on the situation. They have to be viewed as a whole. Now, proponents of this kind of decision-making use this guiding framework to act in the most loving way. And that becomes the standard to maximize harmony, and to reduce discord. Now, situation ethics and moral relativism really um, began to, to spread, at least in the Western world in, in America, in the 1960s. There was a, an Anglican theologian named Joseph Fletcher. And Joseph Fletcher wrote a book called Situation Ethics, The New Morality. He wrote it in 1966. And basically, if you were to follow his, um, his teaching out to the nth degree, well, depending on the situation, adultery could be the right thing to do. Abortion is something that, that could be considered brave, depending on the situation. Or in, in, our, in our day and age, you know, coming out as gay or, or perhaps, you know, identifying as, you know... Uh, uh, you're not your biological gender, well, that could be courageous. And so why is this? Why have we come to this point in our culture? I want to suggest to you a few things this evening. But the main thing is that we have denied the existence of absolutes. We've denied absolutes. Our culture, in a lot of ways, is like the culture that you read about in the Bible in the book of Judges. There was one verse that seems to come up time and time again in the book of Judges. This is just one example of it in Judges 21, 25. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Doesn't that sound very modern? This is, this is the kind of thing that, that we hear all the time. That you do what is right for you, or as the young people say, you do you and I'll do me. <laughs> That's the idea. And so what is the guiding principle? What is the standard? Well, then it's subjective. It's perhaps your emotion. It's not truth. It's not a standard at all. It becomes our emotions and, and, and our situation, uh, this, this fluctuating uh, lust or desire, that, that becomes the standard of moral judgment. And this presents a major problem because... The Bible says that our emotions 
Our, our, our hearts, if you will, are notoriously untrustworthy. Now, our emotions have a place. And we have to temper our emotions with logic and with reason and with Scripture and with truth. But Scripture consistently describes our emotions as something that is unstable, very limited, and even destructive at times. And if you want to see a society that lives by this motto, then read the book of Judges. And it's not a pretty picture. It's a society that is absolutely broken, almost beyond repair, and God has to use the most crude instruments available, these people called judges, to help His people survive. So if you want to be depressed, go and read it. But it's very, it's very instructive, and it's very modern. Fletcher said in his book, there are no normative principles whatsoever. There's no fixed moral absolutes. And the only ethic is love. Well, who gets to define love? More on that later. Joseph Fletcher does. But he, he called his book Situation Ethics, The New Morality. I want to suggest to you that there's nothing new about it. The first case of situation ethics is on page 2 of your Bible. Page 3, rather depending on how big your text is in your Bible. Turn to Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3. Let's read a couple of these passages together. Genesis chapter 2, first of all in verse 16. Here we are in the Garden of Eden. Everything is good that God had made. He places Adam and Eve in the garden to work the garden and tend the garden. Adam is to watch out over his wife and protect her and lead her and love her in a sacrificial way. And God gives Adam the law. He gives Adam a fixed divine truth. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 16, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Now he could have stopped there, but he didn't. He gives a reason for this. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. He doesn't mince his words. It's very easy to understand. This is an absolute command. You can eat of any tree except for this tree. If you eat of this tree, it's going to be bad news for you. You will surely die. Fast forward to chapter 3. The wicked serpent slithers his way into God's good world and, and, and seeks to drive a wedge between humanity and God, between creation and His God. And, and so Eve repeats basically verbatim this, uh, this command that God gave to Adam. And then the serpent responds in verse 4, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, is the devil lying here? Or is he just, is he just sort of giving a little subtle shift in perspective? You continue reading, and they do eat the fruit, and they don't drop down dead on the spot. They didn't die in the sense, perhaps, that we understand death. In fact, it was much worse than they could have imagined. They died relationally, they died spiritually, and they would eventually die physically. But here in Genesis 3, here is Eve confronted with this new knowledge, which is really not knowledge, it's untrue. And Eve's situation changes. And so what was wrong a moment ago in chapter 2 and verses 7, 16 and 17 doesn't seem wrong at all. In fact, when you hear, the, hear the, the, the serpent side of things, it seems like God is trying to hold you down. It seems like God is the one that's wrong. And maybe eating this fruit is the right thing to do. So what has Eve done? Essentially, she has taken a divine law She's brought it down to her level. She's scrutinized it with satanic wisdom and she's thrown it out. And this same kind of idolatry is at work today. When we hear statements like, even from religious people, well, my God would never condemn XYZ. My God would never say that to XYZ. My God would never condemn such and such to hell. As if you have a God, and I have a God, and J.R. has a God. So as if we have, to, we have to take this law, we have to bring it down, as Eve did, and scrutinize it. And we find objection with it. 
Now, what all these objections to God have in common is our inability to bring God's plans, God's wisdom, God's actions under our understanding. We feel like for us to reasonably accept God and become a Christian and serve God or whatever, that His Word must be amenable to my reason. Because my brain is wired a certain way to think a certain way, and so it has to go through this filter, and it has to make sense to me. And what happens is, we create a golden calf. We create a new and improved God. We take Scripture and we might cut and paste and we might even, as Thomas Jefferson did, literally cut it out of our Bibles so that we can fashion a God. And who does that God end up looking more like? He looks like us. He looks less like the Creator. He looks more like the creature. In fact, God had a word to say to His people in Psalm 50. In verse 21, He said, You thought that I was just like you. And they were never more wrong. Voltaire said something, I believe, that is both humorous and true. He said, In the beginning, God created man in His own image, and ever since, man has been trying to return the favor. Why? Because we lost sight of that which is absolute. What do we mean when we say absolute? Absolute, this word defined philosophically, is an unchanging point of reference. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be taken away from it. It is unchanging. It is complete. It is detached. It is pure the way that it is. And it's so important that we appeal to absolutes. We make sense of, of, of reality based upon our appeal to absolutes, to unchanging standards of measurement. In fact, it's kind of silly when you hear someone trying to argue against absolutes. When they use absolute statements. You can't use objectivity to deny objectivity. It's philosophically impossible to do. We're always appealing to absolutes all the time in every walk of life. You have standards for the currency in your wallet. 20 bucks in Danville is 20 bucks in Akron, Ohio, where I was born. You have standards for communication. When I use certain words, you understand those words. Hopefully, we're on the same level. You have standards of weight. You have standards for distance and time. If I travel 60 miles an hour in my car, and it takes me an hour, and I travel 60 miles an hour in my car in Ohio, and it takes me an hour, I'm going the same speed, and I'm traveling the same distance. Because of these, we're appealing to absolute standards here. If we would deny absolutes, it would disrupt reality. And the reason why we find it necessary to appeal to absolutes is because that's how God made us. <laughs> because that's how the absolute made us. Doesn't God fit this definition right here? Isn't God philosophically defined? Isn't He the absolute and unchanging point of reference. There's never a time when God didn't exist. There's no power in creation that could alter His nature or change His character. There's nothing that you and I can do to, to, to add to Him or, or take away from Him. He is by nature unchanging. He is the absolute. God said through His prophet Malachi, For I, the Lord, do not change. In the New Testament, through his servant James, said that he is the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. He is unchanging. Aristotle wrote long ago about the Creator. And he called him the unmoved mover, the uncaused cause. He is the one who causes all things to happen. Nothing causes him. He is uncaused. He is the standard by which we judge all things. Man is not the measure of all things. God is the measure of all things. Now, if we could wrap our minds around that truth, that would serve us. As it served David in Psalm 8, as David looked upon the sky, he saw the heavens. He saw the stars and how it declared the handiwork of God. 
He saw how perfect God is, this absolute God, and he looked at himself and he says, What is man that you would be mindful of him? The son of man that you would think about him. Brethren, we make sense of reality by appealing to absolutes. Can I give you an example? Sometimes, you know, we, either me or Rachel, well, not sometimes, all the time, me and Rachel go pick up Simon from school. You know when you're sitting in, in traffic and there might be, you know, a line to your right or a, a line to your left, and you've perhaps been stopped for a long time, and you notice the car in your peripheral vision begins to drift. You know what I'm talking about? There's that, that weird sensation that you have. There's that moment of hesitation where you think, now wait, is he moving or am I moving? Do you know what I'm talking about? And so what do you do? You press very firmly on the brake and then you look with your eyes to find something that doesn't move, don't you? You find a building, a mailbox, a lamppost, something that doesn't move. Why do we do that? We're appealing to an absolute. We measure that which is changing based upon that which does not change. Captains, when they are sailing their ships across the ocean and it gets cloudy, what do they do? Well, I guess we better give up. We'll never make it. They appeal to the stars. right? Pilots who are, who are flying through clouds to, to, to navigate, what do they do? They, they navigate by their instruments, by that which is unchanging. Absolutes are necessary for life, for physical life, for our spiritual life, and our moral life. It's no different with our morality. And our absolute is the God of truth. And we appeal to His, His communication to us, His scripture, His words of truth. We know, as Jeremiah does, that it is not within us to walk that is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. In fact, when we do it the Judges 21-25 way, it's horrifying. We make all sorts of terrible choices. We, 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 we ruin our lives, and our lives become chaotic, and we ruin other people's lives. There's a way that, that might seem right to us, but its end is the way of death. And so we need some kind of help. We need something that doesn't move. I need to find some sort of anchor, some sort of guiding light. And that's what God has given us in His Word. And His Word is truth. And His Word acts as a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. I'm reminded of the words of, of the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, you might turn over there. I don't have it in the screen behind me. Hebrews chapter 6. And the Hebrew writer is writing to the children of promise, to the children of Abraham, that God has made a promise to them. To bless them. And the Hebrew writer writes in verse 16 of chapter 6, for people swear by something greater than themselves. And sometimes people do that today, right? If they want to really tell the truth, they seal it with an oath. They'll swear on something greater than themselves. You've heard it said, I swear upon my grandmother's grave or something like that. That's the idea here. You swear by something greater than yourself. And in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. It's, it's, it's the seal that, that I'm telling the truth. Now here's God. When God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of promise, that's us, the unchangeable character of His purpose, what did He do? He did the same thing. He guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. God has made a promise. He's going to keep His promise. Why? Because He swore. Because God doesn't change. And God cannot lie. And His Word will always be true. And now we have His Word as a sure and steadfast anchor of our souls. His promises, His, His Scriptures, His Word to us, that is the absolute truth that tethers us to reality. And severing that anchor we're going to be like ships that are morally adrift and confused. And all of our religious convictions are going to fluctuate depending on, on the situation if we're not appealing to this standard. In fact, they're going to cease to be convictions at all. There is a businessman 
He was sitting on a plane next to a woman that he found very attractive. So he strikes up a conversation with this woman. And this woman is very flattered with all of his attention. He's very well dressed. You can tell that, that he, he perhaps is a wealthy man and, she's, and he's, he's being very flattering with his speech. And he finds her attractive. Finally, they get to talking and finally at the end of the flight, this man offers her a proposal. One night for one million dollars. And at first, this woman is shocked that this man would be so forward, but in the back of her mind, she's a little bit flattered that he would even make this proposal at all. And so she thinks about it for a while, and eventually she agrees. And so they talk about it, and they agree on a time and a place where they would meet. And the plane lands, and they're taxiing on the runway. And the businessman turns to her and said, you know, I'd like to make one small amendment to my proposal. I really don't have that kind of money. Would you consider the same proposition for $25? And the woman is so enraged. And she responds to the man, What kind of woman do you think I am? And the man simply said, Well, we've already established what kind of woman you are. Now we're just haggling over the price. <laughs> this raises an interesting point as Christians. Obviously this woman and this man were not behaving as children of God. Biblical skeptics, philosophers, subjectivists, they all argue that every person has a price, Christian or not. Everybody has their price. The only difference is at which point we surrender our convictions. And so your situation will determine your morality and what you believe in to be true. Is that true? Do we all really have a breaking point where we would trade the most valuable, deepest held treasures for a moment of pleasure or to escape some kind of pain? If our convictions are subject to fluctuating circumstances and morality is relative, then guess what? Sexual promiscuity is normal. Then lying is just part of being human, it's just par for the course. And we should expect acts of violence, and we should expect murder. After all, relativism, situation ethics, according to someone like Joseph Fletcher, quoting from his book, are working toward the greatest good for the greatest number. What Joseph Fletcher called the agapeic calculus, that Greek word for love, the love math suddenly moral relativism will show its true colors. If truth is relative, then what's good for me is not good for you. What's true for me is not true for you. And so one person's love is another person's hate. And if I'm convinced it's the right thing to do to murder that person, then who are the victim's family to disagree? And moral relativists say that love, love is the highest good, it's the first order value. Love is the only good. And there's no objective moral good. Well, if we really believe that there's no objective moral bad, then to remain philosophically consistent, then there must be no objective moral bad. Now, we know that's not true. Because I don't care what you believe or where you come from, if someone steals your car, you're going to be angry about it. If someone, you know, murders somebody in your family, you're going to want justice to be done. Why is that? Why is that no matter what culture you're in, no matter what you believe, if something awful happens to you, if you've been wronged and you have a sense of justice, why is that? Well, morality must be transcendental. It must go above us, is what I'm trying to say. It goes beyond society. It goes beyond constitutions. It goes beyond manifestos and government documents and Supreme Court rulings. It goes beyond this world. Because God defines what's right and what's wrong. And we are made in His image. And any moral outrage that we have it simply can't be expressed without appealing to an absolute standard of right and wrong. 
If we exchange absolute truth and absolute morality for relative truth and relative morality, then any conviction that we have is not going to be consistent. It's just going to dissolve into a matter like the woman of haggling over price. And we'll be like that possessed man. Sure, the one demon left her, and the man swept his house. That demon got seven more and infiltrated his life again, and his latter state was far worse than the first. You know, anytime we have a sermon, we want to mention Jesus. We want to preach Jesus. Is this how Jesus lived his life? Could his convictions be bought? No, sir. No, sir. When Jesus was starving, he was on the threshold of death in the wilderness, the devil tempted him. We have three examples in Scripture in Matthew chapter 4 when the devil tempted him. And each time, what did Jesus say? What was his response to the, to the devil? It is written. What is Jesus doing there? He is appealing to an absolute standard of right and wrong. I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to twist this situation. You're trying to make me feel like it's okay to turn this, th these stones into bread and feed myself. But it is written. To Jesus, God's word was final. Satan knew it, and so Satan left him alone. And so he, he submitted himself to the Father, and we can too. And we can resist the devil. He will flee from us, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. The question that we're talking about tonight, of whether truth and moral convictions are absolute or relative, in our universities, this is the kind of ridiculous thing that our young people are talking about in their classrooms. Bringing up these what-ifs, bringing up these situations in which trying to get these students to, 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 to at least say, well, in some situation it would be right to lie, it would be right to steal, or whatever. And the way that it's packaged is that these are all intellectual arguments. These are not intellectual arguments. These are moral arguments. Relativism, subjectivism, situationalism, they're all these veiled attempts by us to escape any feeling of judgment so that we can live how we want to live. What happens? What happens when you exchange the truth about God for a lie? Read Romans chapter 1, and Paul will tell you. Society will grow more and more debased, more and more chaotic, more and more destructive. Every vile and hateful practice will follow. But my biggest issue with this, brethren, is that it drives no one to the cross of Jesus for forgiveness. All this kind of thinking does, this vain philosophy does, is perpetuate sin and encourage self-justification under the guise of moral relativism. Sexual promiscuity begets abortion, begets wholesale uh, se selling of, of fetal body parts. That's happened in our lifetime. People are, are selling parts of human beings. Track that upstream and you, you see what, what philosophy is, is at the head of that river. Under the guise of moral relativism, homosexuality is going to beget gender identification, which will beget pedophilia. Health care equals termination of life, and we're living in a judge's world. Operating under, under this, this idea of, of relativism, who is to say that Hitler was wrong? Who is to say that Stalin was wrong or Osama bin Laden were wrong? They were only doing what was right in their own eyes. And with all of our modernism, with all of our supposed sophistication and our philosophical understanding of the universe or whatever, we've tried to explain away this rebellion that we simply don't want to be held accountable for our actions. And we explain it away with euphemisms. Two plus two is four to all men. But we think morality is different. We think that there's, there's some other standard that applies to morality. That's why God sent His Son. Not just to free us from the bondage of sin, 
but to free us from this kind of empty thinking that will only lead to sin. Abide in my word. You will know the truth. The truth will set you free, he says. But freedom and life come only when we're convicted by the word. Only when we hold up our lives to the absolute, unchanging, morally perfect Word of God, and we see ourselves as God sees us under God's microscope. And there, brethren, it's an uncomfortable picture. We need a Savior. We are sick with sin. We are dead in our sins. And Jesus came not just to make good people or bad people good. He came to make dead people live. So he says, he makes an absolute statement. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. If you believe that statement to be true, and you have the conviction to act on it, we would be thrilled to assist you. If you need to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, or if you need the prayers of this church to strengthen you, then help us help you as we sing this song.